you go. Good job, boys. Thank you. I get my guitar tune before I get up here, but nope, not me. Yeah. 
something like that. <laughs> We're going to turn to page 30. I shall not be moved. What key? I'm showing D. singing out there everyone job, Jeff. we're gonna get mr larry whiteley up here let him do some announcing there i liked it i liked it i'll do some announcing here <laughs> good morning welcome home to all you here and watching out there the sock river cowboy church glad to have you all here I don't know about you, but my favorite day of the week, this is it, because I get to be here with all of you in God's house. Next week, though, got to go see a grandson get married, so won't be here. You guys got it, okay? You can do it. <laughs> okay. And you'll, you'll try. try. <laughs> Again, show these folks you appreciate them. We, we just appreciate everything they do. Really do. 
Do we have any visitors with us this morning? Any visitors? First time visitors. I'm not seeing a hand. There you go. Yeah, glad to have you. You bet. Come back and see us, will you? Okay, good. All right. Folks, there's a lot going on, so make sure you have one of our newsletters. Should be some back on the table here. Uh, or, and read it, or you can go read it online at SongCreeperCowboyChurch.com, too. We've got everything in there. That looks just like the newsletter right there on that computer. It's amazing how it does that. Anyway, <laughs> church camp for grades 6 through 12 starts tomorrow. Uh, there will be a special prayer meeting over the camp uh, today at 6 p.m., asking God to bless this special time for our kids. Directions to the camp for the prayer meeting are in the newsletters there are online. So please go and do that. It's a short drive out there. Can't miss it. Vacation Bible School is August 2nd through 6th, and we're still needing volunteers to help with that. So see the ladies at the kids' check-in desk back there, and they'll help you with that. Thursday, July 29th, is our fifth Thursday sing at the Livestock Center. We're going to have hamburgers and hot dogs, and they'll serve them about 6 p.m. Bring a dessert if you don't wish to do that. At 7 p.m., the band Ozark Mountain 4 will be entertaining for you all. Good to see the Porter family back with us, too. We missed them. I definitely missed them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, give me a hand. You bet you. We we'll appreciate it. All right. Anybody get birthday this week besides my wife? <laughs> I was, was going to mention that. Yeah. Yeah. There it is out here. They're out here's birthday, too. Yeah. <laughs> Right back here, yeah, over ah. there. My goodness, a lot of birthdays. Big ugly in the overalls there. <laughs> Big ugly. All right, bunch of them. Got one over there, too? Yeah, there's a lady. Glad to have you. You bet you. All right, uh, how about anniversaries? And my wife and I had our 52nd last week, and I forgot to mention it, so we'll do that, too. All right. Anybody else with anniversaries? Right here. Man, you got a birthday and an anniversary. Did wow. you do that on purpose so you wouldn't forget? Okay, I just wanted any any other anniversary? I hear too, yeah. Back here, yeah. All right, we've got several of them. Hey, Dawson. Our the best birthday anniversary singer we got. That's right. Well, not That's right. Hurt your feet, well, I just gotta live in the reality. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And a one, and a two, and a one, two, three. Happy birthday. something to think about. We all like heroes, don't we? God likes heroes too. A hero is here this morning, folks. It could be a person you passed or said hi to on the way to your seat or sitting right next to you and you don't even know it. Maybe it's a volunteer who works in our church security Maybe as they work to make sure you are safe, they pray, asking God to watch over all of us this day. Maybe it's a volunteer who makes the coffee and puts the food out for you and does all that, the snacks. Maybe they, maybe they pray that your soul will be nourished and you'll find Jesus today. Maybe it's the volunteer who helps when you drop the kids off to Children's Church or help them get the, signed up for church camp or vacation Bible school. Perhaps their morning prayers include the children and that your kids will come to know Jesus. Maybe it's one of our volunteer band members up here or someone who brings the special music. Maybe they silently pray that by using the gifts God gave them, it will prepare your heart and others to hear the word Scotty will bring us today to help someone find Jesus. Maybe it's a volunteer working our sound system or taping the services for others to see, and they're praying that you will hear the word and it will change lives. Now, I know all those folks don't uh, quite fit our image of a hero, do they? They are too, uh, well, kind of normal. Heroes make headlines in social media, don't they? Yeah. 
yeah. all over the hero. But we seldom see heroes in the making, do we? And we seldom recognize heroes, but these people are. God's hero prays for, reaches out to, or inspires others to know Jesus. And one of them, one of them might be nearer than you think. They may be looking back at you when you look in the mirror. Think about that. Bow with me, please. Our dear Heavenly Father, we want to lift up, especially right now, our kids' church camp and all the young lives that will be there. And Lord, we're thankful for all the volunteers that are going to be there to help. We pray that folks will come to that prayer meeting to bless that tonight, Father, out there. And uh, we pray decisions we made just like they were last year. We'll have more kids come to know you, Father. Father, just uh, also pray for Vacation Bible School coming up. More, we'll get those kids involved in you. Father, may each of us do everything we can each and every day to tell others about you. Again, don't hide it under a bush. Oh, no. Not supposed to. We're supposed to be bold telling the story of Jesus. Father, I just... Uh, Thank you for all the many blessings you give each and every one of us every day. Help us to always glorify you and your son. That's just my precious son's name. Amen. God bless you all. God bless this church and God bless America. You can stand if you want to. Just wave and smile and like that. You can do that while the band gets started up again. All right. God bless you all. turn to page 12. Um, come and dine. Bread and fish. 
fish up on the fire. Thus he satisfies the hunger every time. Come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. The hungry calleth now, come and dine. Ron, you want to play a little bit on that sax? special music out here um, we're going to bring up it's squealing just so you know I don't know what but it is it may be this mic right here I don't know On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, an emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So, so I'll cherish. Cling to the old 
Good job. Is it Regina or Rogina? Rogina. I thought so, but I, wouldn't, I didn't want to make that mistake. There you go, sir. There's not anybody who drives farther to get to church than you either, right? You might. You should know some Lebanon, I think, or somewhere up in that, in that God-forsaken country. Just joking. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. My goodness, you're looking good this morning. You all must have brushed your teeth this morning or something. I don't know. You're looking sharp. <clears throat> well, today I'm going to be preaching out of the book of Acts. Get your Bible to the first chapter in the book of Acts, and I'll, I'll stay a little while in the first chapter, and then we'll go to the second chapter. <clears throat> I don't know. I may get to preach and just preach the whole Bible, the whole book. May never stop. You all aren't hungry, are you? Oh, you are? Okay. Well, go back and Rose will get you a little bite, and, and you come back in. Uh, I have to be honest today, um, Rose kind of gave me a piece of cake when I got here, and I feel better about it. Okay. Today, I'm going to be preaching on the, the title is Dear Theophilus, and I'll explain that. That sounds a little bit obscure, uh, arcane, but you stay with me. I'll explain what that means. Now, folks, you may, you're aware that I'm counting down my ministry. I'm about to retire. I'm choosing my sermons very carefully. I want to share with you uh, things that I want you to know. Uh, I want to emphasize, I've been emphasizing certain things I'll talk about in just a moment, but I'm very carefully choosing sermons because knowing I won't get to be preaching to you that much more, and I want you to hear these things uh, from me very clearly because as we close Come close to the end. I'm giving emphasis to certain things. Now, quite honestly, I'm pretty much finished with four main subjects that I've been preaching on for the past few years. I'm going to tell you about them right now. I believe we're approaching a biblical end-time events, and I preached on that as hard as I know how to preach on it. Number two, I believe more intense persecution is coming to the earth. I believe you're going to be persecuted. And if you don't believe that, read your Bible. Read the book of Revelation. Read some of the, it's coming. Number three, I believe a great deception is about to be unfolded upon the earth. In fact, it's already being unfolded. And it is what Jesus said about the great deception. He said, if it were possible, even the very elect will be deceived. So this is so scary to me because this deception will be so good that it will pull many people, bring many people, good people, godly people, born-again people, will be caught up in this deception and will be dragged away from the, from the remnant church. I'm going to talk about those two things. Okay, approaching end times events. I've preached on that hard for the past few years. Persecution is coming. Deception is coming. And then finally, a great falling away is coming. There's going to be a mass departure from evangelical or real church work. Not just real, but evangelical and, and all kinds of church. So time is pretty much running out for me to focus on these subjects. And uh, I know some of you are thrilled that I'm going to be going in other directions because I know that I hear from some of you that, that you're getting a little tired of me talking about these certain things. Sorry about that. No, I'm not. But anyway... Uh, but, but time is running out for me on these, and so I'm going to go in other directions for the next few sermons that I have, that I'll be with you today. Today, I want to look deeply into the uh, first church, the original church, because if you guys and I, I've said this many times, if you want to know what uh, a fake thing looks like, a fake thing looks like, find out what the real thing's like. So we're going to look at the real thing today, so we can better identify this Babylon church that's coming, this new church that's going, not coming, but pretty much here already, but it's going to try to draw millions of Christians off into a, a not heresy as much, but a Laodicean sort of experience. And if you know what I mean by that, good. If you don't read the book of Revelation, you'll find about the Laodicean church. 
I want to look deeply into that today so that we can identify what the real church is, is about. There is about to become a split in Christianity, more, uh, more so than ever before in the history of the world. Uh, even between Catholicism and Protestantism, a bigger split than that is coming in Christianity. This split is going to take a group of the Christian population of the planet off into what the Bible calls the Babylonian church. It'll be the church of, of culture. It'll be the church of the feel-good. It'll be the church of the great music and the great buildings, and, and you go to church and you'll feel good about it. It'll, in other words, it'll be entertaining, uh, inter- entertainianity. A lot of people are going to go for that instead of Christianity. So that Babylon church is coming, and my, my, it's, it's here now. And many are going to go off into the, to the Babylon church, and what's going to be left is the remnant church. The remnant church will be a church that could even possibly be underground. It might not even meet publicly. I'm not sure how this is going to work, but I'm telling you, a split is coming in Christianity. And it will be bigger, as I said, than any split we've ever seen before between Catholic and Protestant, etc. It's going to be huge. The remnant church will be like the first century church that we're going to meet at Pentecost. And today, if I can get to chapter 2 of Acts, we're going to be looking at uh, some of the events, some of the things that the first church looked like, so that we can pattern our lives and position ourselves to be that church. Now, the book of Acts was written by Luke. Luke was a physician, a doctor, a scientist of his day uh, from Syria. Luke is, um, uh, he was a more of a, he was closer to European uh, or Greek thought and philosophy than were the apostles, they were more oriental. They are more from, uh, from the Eastern philosophies, the Judaism and all, as was Luke. Luke tended toward the Greek thought, which that's our, our background for our thinking. He's Greek thinking. And he was more, in a, he was a Hellenized Greek, uh, more like the Western Europeans. So when we read the book of Luke, we're reading the writing of a scientist of a Western mind, Greek mind. He, in other words, he's more like us. When he, when he talks to us, he's going to be thinking like us. His thought patterns are formed like us. He's more like us when we do read the, the book of Luke. Okay, if you're ready, we'll start in Acts chapter 1, verse 1. And he's going to say, in my former book, what's that former book? The Gospel of, of Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke. This is the same one who wrote Acts. Okay, so he says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. So Paul, sorry, Luke, Luke sets out to preach to us out of the gospel, of, out of his gospel. He wants to tell us everything about Jesus from the day he was born until the day he, he ascended into heaven. That's his, that's his mission. That's his plan. He wrote the book to a guy named Theophilus. Have you ever heard of the, the word Theophilus? Have you ever met a guy named Theophilus in the Bible any other place? No. Why is it? Because he wasn't in any other place. So who is this Theophilus guy? Well, it wasn't a guy. It wasn't a girl. It wasn't an angel. It was, it was a category of people. He wrote it to the Theophilus, the, the lover. Theos means God. Philus is lover of, lover of God. He wrote it to the, anybody that loves God. This, le, this is written to you. So he set out to give us this comprehensive report. And he continues in verse 3, talking about Jesus. He said, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. <clears throat> so he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Now, this is an eyewitness support, report. Report. This is an eyewitness report from a <clears throat> Greek-thinking, uh, Occidental, or more European mindset. Uh, someone like us, he's giving us a real report of an eyewitness. He said, I saw it. I was with him. This is not hearsay for me. Uh, I didn't get this from anybody else. My own eyes saw it. My own hands touched him. My own ears heard his words. I even ate meals with him. He was here. 
on the earth, and I am, a, I am a living witness. I was with him for 40 days. He was with us for 40 days after his resurrection, and we spent that time with him. Uh, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. Now, look at verse 4. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Whoa, wait a minute. Something caught my mind there. What was it? One time while he was eating with them. Jesus was eating with the apostles in his after-resurrection body. Woohoo! When we get to heaven, we're going to get to eat if we want to. We're going to have glorified bodies. Amen. Hallelujah. Pass the biscuits. Rose, get to cooking back there. <clears throat> we're we're, we're we're going to get to eat when our bodies, when we get glorified bodies. I kind of like that. Mm-mm. I'm going to have a swimming pool filled with chocolate pie. And dive in and just eat my way across. And never gain a pound. Hallelujah. <clears throat> now get this, see. It said on one occasion he was eating with but But don't forget that over that 40-day period, he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. That was his preaching. That was his teaching. That's what he wanted to talk about. And it was, there's a lot to talk about. But he wanted to talk about the kingdom of God. How that he was going to reclaim planet earth. How that was going to be God's again. And how we would be his children. Redeemed, restored, you know, the whole thing. So, on one occasion he was eating. Then he said to them, while he was eating with them, on this one occasion, do not leave Jerusalem. He said, don't leave Jerusalem. Stay here. But wait for the gift my father promised, you, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So he said, there's something coming. Stay in Jerusalem. Do not leave. Early church, wait for this. This is going to be amazing. Don't leave Jerusalem. Stay here. It's coming. Don't leave, but wait for the gift. Uh, the gift is coming. Wait for the gift. What is it? A baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's a Holy Spirit baptism. And that's what happened when the early church was born there at Pentecost. God came and baptized that congregation, that church, with His Spirit. He filled it with His Spirit. In and out and over and over and over and under. He filled that church with His power and when, with His Holy Spirit. Now, the apostles... When they were there eating with Jesus and, and spent this private time with him at this post-resurrection debriefing, I like to think of it, they asked him a lot of questions. They, well, whew, I'd like to have had a list of my questions submitted by one of them, wouldn't you? But they were asking him a lot of questions. And they said in verse 6, they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. In other words, ain't none of your business. Are you going to restore the kingdom now? He said, none of your business. He said, it's not for you to know, okay? He said it a lot plainer, nicer than I would have said it, but he said, you, you, you're not supposed to know this. Now, I, I've told you often my, my uh, opinion, and again, remember what opinions are worth, nothing, my opinion is that the reason Jesus did not know or that he didn't want them to know or didn't, they didn't have, need to know is because he didn't know. No one knew when the kingdom is going to be restored. And the reason for that is human free will. Jesus gave us a free will. And if we as a populace of the planet were to get our acts together, get our hearts right with God, come back and build biblical lives and biblical families, biblical governments. If we would do that, we could postpone the end-time events indefinitely. But if we don't, and I, don't, I think we've chosen not to, I think we're on a different track entirely, that we're going to speed this all up. I believe we have chosen as a populace of a planet to go our own way, and this is going to happen rather quickly, which is kind of what my teaching recently has been about. You're going to restore the kingdom to Israel. Are you going to, it's a p political question, are you going to make Israel, are you going to do all this stuff at this point? And Jesus said, no, you don't need to know. Not only that, you can't know. He said, you, here's what you need to know. Here, in other words, in verse 8, he's going to tell them 
how this is going to work, here's what you need to know. Look at verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, I don't know how long this is before Acts chapter 2, but it's just days, if not hours. But he said, you're soon going to know, and power is going to come on you, and then when it does, you're going to be my witnesses. Now, so get this, this dynamic here. Jesus had been on the earth for 33 years. He died physically. His spirit then, uh, when he was, sorry, when he was raised out of the grave, he came back to life in his glorified body, his eternal body, just like the one we're going to get when we die. And he came back in that glorified body, lived on the earth at least 40 days. Then he ascended back to heaven. We're going to read about that in, in just a moment, verse 9. He ascended up to heaven. And when he got to heaven, the Holy Spirit came to the earth. Now, get this. Jesus goes up, physical body. The Spirit, of the Holy Spirit of God, comes down to the earth. Now, what does the Holy Spirit do when it gets here? It filled the church. It came into the church. And it made, it made your hands and my hands the hands of Jesus. It made your feet and my feet the feet of Jesus. When the Spirit came, we became the body of Christ on the earth. We are the temple of the Lord. And the Holy Spirit fills us and uses us. And everywhere we go, we take Jesus with us. We become that. So that's how this all works. And he said, not only am I going to come and give you that, but you're going to have power and you're going to have gifts. And he said, when you start doing this, this ministry, when you start doing this mission work, he said, start in Jerusalem. Uh, let me say it like this. Start in your hometown or start at home. Start with your own family. Make sure they know the Lord. Make sure they know about the kingdom of God and that they've invested in it and they've come into it and they've, they've bought into it. Make sure they and then move it out. Move to, to Springfield and let's get Springfield evangelized. And then let's move to, to Green County and Christian County and those counties around us. Let's move there. Then we go in a bigger circle. Let's go to uh, Oklahoma, Texas, and Arkansas, Missouri, and let's get a bigger circle. And then to the whole world. So Jesus says, concentric circles is where is how we take the gospel. So make sure you follow that marching order. That works great if you'll do that. Okay, so what have we learned thus far? We've learned this. There is going to be a split in the church. There's going to be the Babylon church that will go off into the feel-good religion. Then there's going to be the remnant church that will become the true church, the hands of God on the earth, loving God, loving each other, the whole thing. The remnant church is a spirit-filled church, and it is a mission-minded church. It's not just all about itself. It's a mission-minded organization. Now, we've learned that so far. Verse 9. That wasn't enough. Now it's going to get crazy. Are you ready? Buckle your seatbelts. We're about to see something fantastic here. Verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Oh, my. I mean, would you love to have been there for that experience? Jesus, they're talking to these apostles and disciples and their families and all. Then suddenly, gravity stopped working on him, and he began to float up. He floated up into the heavens. He went up into the air. Is what, I mean, let's not spiritualize this. He went up into the air, up into the atmosphere. And he kept going up and getting littler and littler. And then a cloud came and covered under him, and they couldn't even see him anymore. And he was gone. Now, <laughs> use your imagination a moment and look around the crowd while they're watching this happen. What are they doing? Right? They were catching flies with their mouths. I mean, their mouths were wide open. And they were like, what is going on here? They shouldn't have been surprised. This was Jesus, post-resurrection, glorified body, walking through walls, appearing in the middle of rooms. You know, they should not have been surprised, but they were amazed by this. And then verse 10, they were looking intently. I love that word. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him. Two men dressed in white, stood beside them. Men, men appeared out of nowhere. Were these men? 
No, I don't think they were, but the Bible calls them men because they look like men or women. Or, I mean, we're not being sexist here. They, they look like people, human beings. And uh, it was an angel. It's what we call them, angels. But remember, I told you, angels is not what they are. Angels is what they do. They're messengers. That's what that means, angelos. Uh, that means they bring messages. An angel is a job description. It doesn't tell us who they are. But do you know what angels look like? They look like us. Mm -hmm. They look like us. Or, more accurately, we look like them. They were made first. They're, our elder, they're the elder race, and we were made to look like them. So when an angel comes into a place or appears to us, they look just like us because they're just like us in that regard. In fact, if there's an angel in the room today, would you please stand? We'd just like to ask you a few questions. Okay. No angels here. At least they're not going to stand up. But if they were here, we wouldn't know them and recognize them as odd or different. So two men dressed in white. Well, these guys dressed in white. That might have been a kind of a giveaway right there. And they said in verse 11, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? And I, and I say, with your mouths open. The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Oh, so Jesus is going to come back just like he left. He left into the air and a cloud hit him and he's going to come back. Oh, my goodness, I can't wait to see this happen. Why are you looking into heaven? I've had to, I want to ask a lot of Christian people that all the time. Why are you standing around looking up? Why are you standing around wasting your time looking up? Get busy. Get, get busy. Get doing the mission of God. Use your concentric circles. Take the mission out. Don't spend your time looking up. Get busy doing God's work. That's what these angels told the disciples to do. All right, let's see what we've learned so far. The real church, the remnant, is spirit-filled mission-minded, and Jesus-focused. They're focused on Him. So, as you're putting together your life for this end of the church age experience that we're in, you, you might want to consider those issues and make sure you are connected to God in that way. In Acts chapter 2, we're about to be introduced to, the, to God again. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father, God in one, three God, one God, three forms. God ex, ex, expresses Himself in spirit, in flesh, which was Jesus, and Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, King James says. But it's Father, Son, and Spirit. Those three make up one God. Now, I've just told you everything I know about God. The, the, the rest of that's above my pay grade. I don't know any more to tell you than that, except all what Jesus did. Now, the big idea today is that the church is the spirit-filled body of Jesus in the world today. And I've already talked about that, about your hands are his hands. Your feet is, are his feet. We are Jesus in the world today. So what do we need to know? Acts chapter 2. Let's go that down. Acts chapter 2. Turn the page. <clears throat> When the, Christ, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Who were they? Well, the apostles, their wives or whatever, their kids, and the followers. They were all a bunch of people together in one place on the day of Pentecost. Verse 2, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Okay, get this now. They were in this room sitting, a large room. We don't know exactly where. They were sitting, and the, a sound began to come from the atmosphere. It came from the air, it says. It came, it's a sound. Now, it wasn't wind. It sounded like wind. But it was power, dynamos. It was coming from the air, and it came into the room when they were sitting, and it was, I could just, it was shrieking, and all the noises of a hurricane and a tornado were in the room, but there wasn't a hair on their heads being blown around. All right, it was a sound, a shrieking, loud, dynamic, powerful sound. Keep reading with me. Fill the whole house. Verse 3, they saw 
what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All right, visualize this. Something that seemed a, a burning object appeared in the room. A bur- an, an orb, a, a burning something appeared in the room, flaming dynamically, powerfully bright and light, and it split up. It blew apart and came and rested on each of the persons in the room. So the fire came in the room, it split up, and came individually to everybody there. You got the picture? Shrieking wind, exploding fireballs, fire... I mean, mean, this is movie-type stuff. So what was the effect? The Holy Spirit came with power, symbolized by the two most dynamic, powerful things the first century church understood. They didn't understand lasers. They had no nuclear theology, uh, theology, uh, understanding, physics. They didn't get that. So otherwise, they might have said, well, it was like an atomic bomb, or it was like a laser. No, it was fire and wind. They knew fire and wind. So that's what the, Jesus used to show who he was and what he was. So the Pentecost experience was the birth of the church, and the church then, of course, is the spirit-filled believers and the spirit-filled community. Then he began to give gifts to his people. Look at verse 4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, they said. We hear them, it's like we hear all the the languages from wherever we are, we hear those languages, we understand it. Uh, So the result of the sound, the shrieking sound and the exploding fireball, well, the result of that was supernatural gifts were given to the church to the people. They could speak and they could understand. <clears throat> Some who have d- done deep dives on this, the language here have said that truly this was a miracle of two kinds of miracle. Number one is a miracle of speaking, but it was also a miracle of hearing. It was under, they heard, in, they could hear in other languages. They could speak in languages they had not learned. Both, it was a miracle. Now skip down to verse 12. In verse 12, the very typical human (laughs) emotion enters into the the story. In verse 12, amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Mm -hmm. You see, often when God does something, human beings, we don't understand it. Did you know that? Sometimes we don't know what in the world is going on. We think we do, but we don't hardly ever fully understand it. God's ways are not our ways. His ways are higher than ours, better than ours, grander than ours. Pick out a category. He's better. And so when God does things, we may say, what are you doing? There's some some experiences in my family now that I want to ask God, God, what are you doing? And I've other people that I've talked with even this morning, why would God do this? Why? What are you doing, God? We have to remind ourselves our ways are not his ways. His ways are better, bigger than ours. So some were making fun of him, and they said, well, they're just drunk. So after these people got through talking, Peter stood up. Now Luke's telling the story. Peter steps up uh, to everyone. When they calmed down, I guess the shrieking stopped, and maybe, I don't know about the fire, what happened to it, but... But we know that now we don't hear about it anymore. But something happened. So Peter then stands up when the rumors start floating around that these people have been drunk. They're drinking. Peter stands up. Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only 9 in the morning. No, This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, time's not going to let me take you to the prophet Joel, let you read this. But this afternoon, if if you're not after your nap, go get the book of Joel and read what it says here. You'll have some interesting things. Now, you remember he said this to, who does Peter, what does Peter say? Dress the crowd. He says, and all of you who live in Jerusalem. Well, there wasn't that many there when this all started. What do you think? has happened to cause all of Jerusalem to be here. A noise that was so loud, it was shrieking, and it was heard all over the city. 
and fire and, and phenomenon happened, it drew a huge crowd. This wasn't some little isolated little event. This was huge, and the people there came, and they said, what is going on? They didn't know. There were people in there walking around speaking in tongues, and thought, what's wrong with these people? They're drunk. Peter says, no, they're not. Read the book of Joel, you'll find out what's going on. <clears throat> now, here's what we've got to do. Peter, Peter continues to talk. He says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Prophesy can mean to tell the future or to tell the truth, to tell the Word of God. It can be both. <clears throat> so in the last days, there will be an increase. This is very important. There will be an increase in prophecy and visions. An increase in prophecy and visions. I, until about five years ago, had never preached a prophetic sermon in my life. And since then, I can hardly preach anything else. It's like God has given me a prophetic message that I never had before. What's going on? I think part of this experience is now ex my experience. That God has given me new understanding. And not just preachers, but the daughters and sons will preach. Young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams. Same thing, visions, dreams. Even on my service, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. In other words, everybody in those days will have prophetic gifts given to them. More and more, an increase in prophetic gifts will be given. You say, well, that's not happening. Is it? Isn't it? The answer is, yes, it's happening. From this congregation, in the past year, past two years, on multiple occasions, I've had people come to me after the service or prior, so it doesn't matter, but come to me, and they'll say, Scotty, the Lord has shown me a vision. I had a dream. And, and some will say, and God told me to tell you. Seriously, they'll bring a, ves a message from God to me, and I love that. I think it's wonderful. I wish I could just hear it myself once in a while. But they're hearing visions. You people are having visions this is coming. It's growing with intensity, and you will experience. Some of you will be experiencing this in the years, days and years to come. And when it is, just understand, it's prophesied. This is part of what's coming. You're going to have visions and dream, dream, dreams, and things that God will speak to you. I've been hearing this. I've been hearing that the Muslim communities around the world are having visitations from Jesus, and he will come to them in their dreams. And many of them are coming to the Lord. Because of, pro of dreams and prophecies. And this is happening uh, not just among Americans or, or Europeans, but it's happening around the world. There's a lot of stuff happening. Aren't you glad we got to live in this day and be here now in this wonderful experience? A great, fresh outpouring of the Spirit. A spiritual awakening of supernatural information will come from all sectors of society. Then let's keep reading. There will be an increase in the number of signs and wonders in the heavens. An increase, uh, let's, let's look at 19. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. Uh, you still got your seatbelts on? You're about to get blown in your mind. Uh, uh, minds get blown away here. What in the world is going on in the world? Can you wa I can't watch a news report anymore from any area. They don't talk about a UFO or something in the sky. Or some phenomenon, I will show signs in the sky. Could that be it? Could be. Very possible. Uh, increased UFO sightings. Artifacts. They're discovering artificial things on the moon and on Mars. Where these things come from. Um, intelligent signals. We're, SETI is now f hearing intelligent signals from the center of our galaxy. Uh, strange things are passing through our solar system. Are you aware of that? Have you guys had your head under a rock? Have you ever heard about this? A strange thing passed through our solar system a couple of years ago. It came in and went out. And as it came in, it took a different course out than it came in. It had a different trajectory. Uh, I get, the word is, oh, oh, mau, mau. That's what they call it. The reason they call it that is because at a telescope in Hawaii, mau, mau, photographed it first, 
and it was an artificial, or we're not sure what it was, but something cigar-shaped came through our solar system and then left. What's going on? Things that we've never experienced before or seen before are happening. Well, Peter says, that's going to happen. Verse 20, the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. I don't know what all that is, but it's probably talking about war, increased fire, and billows of smoke. The world's on force. The world's forests are on fire today. I mean, the, the western states are on fire more than we've ever seen before. It's not just here, but it's in Siberia and other places that is huge fires. Is this what they're talking about here? I don't know, but it could be. Blood, increased war, fire, and billows of smoke, forest fires, volcanic, nuclear war. I don't know. You figure this out. But diminished sunlight, etc. And then I want to close with this verse. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. And everyone who calls upon the Lord, the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, I know how I interpreted that all my life, and I still do. But let me tell you what that doesn't mean. Are you ready? This is very important. It doesn't say, and whoever calls upon the name of medical science will be saved. And it doesn't say, whoever calls upon the name of the government will be saved. And it doesn't say, whoever calls upon the name of wokeness and political correctness will be saved. It says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Yahweh, the Jehovah. You call on his name, Yeshua, and you will be saved. That's what that means. He is the only name that can save you. He is the only hope that we have in this world. That's the message I want you to hear. I want you to remember that message for the rest of your life. I want you to tell people that there is hope. There is going to be a split. There's bad stuff coming, but call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. That's the message of the gospel. That is the message of the Bible. Live it. Trust it. Father, I'm so glad you had people like Luke in mind to write this story, to write this stuff down for us so that we would know what you said. And so with that in mind, I pray today for <clears throat> the people in this room who are making very difficult medical decisions. This day, I know some in this room are just under extreme pressure to receive inoculations, vaccinations, so that they can keep their jobs. Their heart tells them one thing. Their job tells them another thing. I know, Lord, there are people in this room who are torn uh, with all kinds of questions, like, why, Lord, are you doing this? What's going on? I pray you'd help us. We need insight. We need wisdom from God to know how to navigate these difficult days ahead. But, Father, one thing's for sure. We're going to call upon the name of the Lord. We're not going to give in to the, to the ugly hand of the devil as he tries to get us off track. In Jesus we pray. Amen. If you guys want to turn to page 20, we're going to close with Have Thy Own Way. Close us in prayer. Sure. Father, thank you so much for the day that you've given us and the fine earth that you've given us, even though we've messed up so much of it. 
Thank you for the plan that you've given us by which we might be saved. We're thankful for the number of people who meet here and who meet earthwide who have answered your call for salvation and who have chosen to be a part of your kingdom. We just pray that you be with our nation's leaders and now in particular the, the medical field that's being hammered so much with these new COVID varieties that they can't keep up with. Decisions are being made to let people die. And we just pray that you'd be with each and every one represented here and give us the wisdom to do the things that we should do and draw ever closer to you. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.